Reason and Theology Live, a show dedicated to charitable discussions, debates, interviews, commentary, and analysis. The show concentrates on theological topics, historical matters, and philosophical problems with content ranging from introductory material to in-depth examinations. And now, your host, Michael Law. Welcome back, everybody. Your host, Michael, on a Thursday evening. I am excited to announce that I am... Honored to be able to facilitate a discussion between two Eastern Orthodox priests, uh, Father John Whiteford, who has been on the show multiple times, and of course, our very own Eastern Orthodox contributor, Father Patrick Ramsey. I'm going to bring them on here in just a moment, but like, I'm, like I said, I'm going to be facilitating a discussion between the two on the topic of none other than toll houses, uh, which uh, quite a few people asked for us to do. So here it is. Looking forward to this. Father Patrick and Father John coming up next. Fathers, how are y'all doing? Doing good. Yeah, it's it's great to have y'all on. Father Patrick, always an honor. Thank you. <laughs> And Father John, it's been a while. It's good to have yeah. you back on. Well, thank you. I, I I see you added some more books in the background. <laughs> <laughs> and icons, too. <laughs> At least yeah. I'm seeing more this time. I don't know. <laughs> right. My, my books and my places to put them uh, are not uh, growing with equal rapidity. Right. Okay. I, I got you. I understand. <laughs> well, that's great. Well, what we're going to do, like I said, is have a discussion on toll houses. And at first, what I'll do is welcome each of you to just kind of give a brief overview of your understanding of toll houses, your position on the matter, and then open it up for a free for all uh, discussion between y'all if, if y'all would like. Sure. Excellent. And then after that, we'll do some chat questions. So y'all hold mm -hmm. off on your chat questions until towards the end. But whenever you do send them, make sure to send it to at reason and theology so I can pick them out uh, from the comments. Father John, let's start with you. Uh, what exactly are toll houses and, and can you give us your perspective on the matter? Well, the toll houses are an image of an aspect of what we would call the particular judgment. Uh, there's a particular judgment, which is a judgment that each one of us will face when we die. And then there's the final judgment where basically everyone's final destination is settled. And that's what we read about in the book of Revelation, the great white throne judgment and all of that. But um, the, the, the toll house image has become controversial in the last, I guess, uh, 50 years, m mainly because of discussions in, in English. I don't think it's it has historically at least been controversial elsewhere. And uh, we we had people who tried to poo-poo it and say that it was a Gnostic heresy and all kinds of stuff, but it's found throughout the fathers of the church. And basically what it is, an aspect of the particular judgment is that angels and demons play a role in, in the particular judgment. It doesn't mean that they decide our fate. It means that God allows angels and demons to play a role. Uh, get the soul of uh, Lazarus in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. It's not mentioned in that particular parable that demons collected the soul of uh, the rich man. But in the parable of the rich fool, uh, it actually does say tonight they will require thy soul of thee is what it actually says literally in the Greek. And if you read 
uh, Blessed Theophylax commentaries on the Gospel of Luke, he talks about these as the fearsome angels that come like tax collectors and demand the soul uh, of, of, um, of someone who's not really prepared to give it up. And, uh, and so if you die in a state without repentance and, uh, and you, or if you die in a state of repentance, but you haven't brought forth all the fruits of repentance, then the, the demons have some, uh, something to, to, to hold on you. And in the in St. Basil's commentary on Psalm 7, he talks about how Christ in the Gospel of John says that the devil uh, has nothing in him that he can that he can grasp a hold on. But if you die and you haven't worked out your repentance, then then there is something that the demons have to get a hold on. And particularly if you die in a state without repentance at all, you're, you're going to be in really bad shape. And uh, so the image of tax collectors is just one way that you find in the fathers and the church, they speak about demons confronting the soul and trying to uh, cart it off to hell or to Hades to be more precise. Uh, other times it's just talked about as demons, you know, coming, you know, coming after you, after your, your soul at death, like in the prayer and small comp line to the mother of God, we pray that she will, uh, pray for us that we will be delivered from the fearsome demons at, at, the, at the hour of our death. And um, so this is a constant image. We read about it, for example, in the life of St. Anthony the Great. St. Anthony had visions of these things. Uh, we read about it in a lot of the ancient lives of saints, both of East and West, where they had images or they had visions of people after their death. Uh, being confronted by demons. We read about it, for example, in the Ladder of Divine Ascent by St. John Climacus. He talks about a particular monk who died, and uh, and they, they noticed that he seemed to be being interrogated by demons, and he, he actually quotes what this monk was saying at his death, and he said that this monk passed, and we didn't know how uh, the uh, the trial would end. Uh, so So this is throughout the Father's and uh, theologians as diverse as Father Thomas Hopko and uh, Metropolitan Herotheos Vlachos and uh, Jean-Claude Larcher have all affirmed that this is the case. It's just people who don't want to deal with the evidence and try to deny it and never actually refute the evidence. They just dismiss it and say that anyone who says that this is so is a heretic without any evidence from the fathers. Uh, Father Patrick, uh, go ahead and jump in here and tell us your understanding of Toll Houses as well. Yeah, um, yes, I, well, I pretty much agree with what Father John has said, that all that evidence is what I've read as well. So I'm pretty much of the opinion, yes, when the soul passes, there is some form of, I like to talk about the, the demons as accusers, trying to accuse you of your whatever sins, etc. So... Um, and the angels are the, your defense. Um, so it's definitely something of that nature around. Um, so, and if that's what we're talking about when we were seeing the toll houses, and I have no particular issue with that, because as Father John points out, there's plenty of patristic evidence for that sort of thing to go on. Um, we can start to try to analyze what it means. Um, but for, for, for the basics, yes, um, I, I agree that that's there. And now if we, it depends on when, what do we mean by toll houses. It, it can have a good meaning at, at, at that level, or it could be pushed to something which is a bit strange. So if you start to think there's some literal toll houses, or you are starting to define this rather than the idea of repentance which father john points out and as a testimony to your repentance but as sort of somehow uh, achieving certain good deeds or something like that when you start to quantify your good deeds and your bad deeds and um every little point and and um then i think there's a danger of something going astray here we're starting to miss the point of what's going on so i think a lot of it is, is up to a sort of conceptual level and at the same time if you just think that there's some sort of instantaneous the moment of death you find yourself in hell or find yourself in heaven 
or um, that there's no sense of some sort of trial um, or experience or that, I, I think that's not quite right either. Um, and I think, uh, though I'm only guessing, but <laughs> it's a certain level here, I think it is important that the soul, when it passes, actually goes through some form of trial. And it's, I think, for our human character and nature, it seems quite appropriate that the angels are involved in that. Um, process as far as we're able to apprehend it, uh, apprehend them. I think, that in a sense, apprehending God immediately <laughs> would not really be um, possible. So, in a sense, this type of thing is almost has to be enacted through the angels until the second coming, in which case we stand before Christ uh, as the God man uh, himself and before the, angel, uh, the apostles uh, the, um, and all the fathers, etc., who will stand as judge in, of, on the world. Um, so yes, but this is a particular thing. So that's how my basic, I agree with Father John, um, I have concerns about the way it can be interpreted. I, I'd like to sort of um, throw out my sense of asking the question for further discussion, what is salvation? What do we mean by salvation? What is it just about, are we good people? Is it just about if I've ticked all the right boxes? Is it about, um, have I avoided certain s sins sort of thing? So, and as far as I understand the Orthodox thing, it, it, salvation is union with God. It is becoming one with God. It is it is allowing God to be all in you. And what does that mean? God is perfect. God is holy. God is no division. God is love. All this. So for salvation, God must be all he is in each of us um, without any contradiction, without any... Um, limits of, of him or yeah anything that's uh, divisional or or any part that's locked away from him being all he is in us and we and uh, the other thing is he will not force us himself upon us we must be freely accept him being all in us um and the only level of acceptance is perfection the the, the we must god it must be perfectly in us and that suddenly gets scary. <laughs> and not only perfectly in us in a limited way, perfectly in us in an infinite way, which is something beyond our capacity to achieve by any level of works or any good deeds or um, ticking any boxes. This is why any sense of achieving salvation through the law is, is absolutely an anathema to, to Christianity, because it's impossible for man by ticking any boxes to become in union with God, uh, the, how can we achieve a perfection? There's also, in a sense, orthodoxy, there's no sense of any pass mark. There's no extra merits of uh, saints where you, you've somehow achieved salvation and you've got extra grace or something. No, <laughs> perfection is the only um, standard because it's all about God being all in you. Um, and so the question is not asking about how much or what we've done to be saved. It's rather what in our will and our freedom, what barriers are we putting up to God to be all in all in us? In other words, have I got a barrier of a lack of faith? Have I got a barrier of a heresy? Am I believing something that's false? God cannot force himself upon us. And if I've got a false belief that I'm holding to be true, I cut myself from God because uh, God does not believe that. It's not God. God can't be perfectly in us, but I want to believe something contrary to God, I, and I'm bringing division into the, into the Godhead. That's impossible, so I'm cut off. And then it's the virtues. And it's not that I've done anything, but am I refusing to repent of anything? Am I refusing to become like God? So repentance is to aim to become united to God, become like God and everything. And so what's tested is not whether I've done this or that, it's whether I refuse to repent of any particular thing? Am I holding on to something, a sin? Am I holding on to something which is in the way of God? Um, and so this is, in a sense, what we've checked out because the actual perfection is only achieved by the grace of God. Um, but he but He must allow it. We must freely take it. We must freely accept it and freely act it of ourselves. It must be what we want to do as well. And we must begin the act of growth from the life of virtues. So, yes. So I think if you're taking anything to do with toll houses as being you've ticked boxes, you've done this, you've done that. No, I think it's it's wrong. But if it comes down to the demons going, hey, he, he doesn't repent of that or he keeps doing that or keeps doing that. And the angels are going, no, 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 <laughs> he has confessed that. He's, he's done that. There, there's a sense of soul searching in a sense. But 
it's it's just checking the in a sense are you freely willing to be let god be all in all i think has to be your principle and whatever we talk about is in that context um yes so there would be just so <laughs> Um, I, I do have some questions before I just open it up to general discussion. But before that, uh, Father John, did you want to interact with anything you just heard uh, from, from Father Patrick? Well, <clears throat> I think we're going to agree a lot tonight. But mm-hmm. the only thing I would say is, is the question of the literalness of the toll houses is often raised. And I think even if you, if you were to take Father Sarah from Rose as maybe being someone who's on one end of the spectrum within the bounds of acceptable opinion, I don't think even he took it as literally as sometimes people try to say that he took it. And uh, my own issue with this has always been, I, I, I'm, I'm like Father Thomas Hopko, I would say maybe is on the, or close to the other end of the spectrum because he took it as being more of a, um, um, so I'm, Figurative, I'm, right? I'm, I'm, the, the word has escaped me, but basically as an analogy or... Um, um, figurative, maybe? What now? Figurative? Yeah, figurative. Basically, that, they, that these things are instructive. Um, and, um, and, and so he would say, for example, that the various toll houses that are described, say, in the vision of Blessed Theodora were designed to instruct people in the importance of repenting of various types of sin and examining themselves, not so much that there was going to be, um, um, you know, a literal number of toll stations. And, and, and even with toll stations, we're just talking about a group of demons that confront the soul over various issues. And in this vision, you would get the idea that there's demons that basically have certain issues they're going to raise and if you get past them and you come to other demons that raise other issues not that there's a toll booth you know with a sign that you know or a bar that gets raised when you pass or anything like that um but um so so uh, i i think that both of those views are within the bounds of acceptable opinion my problem and the only reason i've ever entered into debates with people on this issue is I think that it, the people who reject it, it exposes an attitude towards tradition that is not orthodox and not healthy because they're just prepared to toss something and declare it to be heretical when it's so clearly embraced by the church. And we literally use the word toll houses in our services and, and in our prayers. Uh, so to say that, that that's heretical means that we need to revise the services if we were to, to buy that, which would also mean that the church has fallen into error for you know more than a thousand years, and that we you know so your your whole idea of the of the infallibility of the church is is uh, brought into question as a result of it. Especially the liturgy being as a, a rule or a guide to right. orthodoxy. As we worship, so we believe. That's that's an yeah. important principle of orthodox theology. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I have a question for y'all. Um, it, are, are y'all saying that this is a form of purgation? Uh, Father John, we'll start with you, then Father Patrick. Well, St. Mark of Ephesus actually talked about how some people are purified by fear at, at the time of death through the things that they experience, but what he, 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 he took issue with at the Council of Florence was the idea that people suffer to pay for sins. Um, but, the, but the idea that if you're, it, it's very clear in the teachings of the church that you can die in a state of repentance, but without having brought forth all the fruits of repentance, which means that you're really not ready to enter into the presence of God immediately. Uh, at the time of your death, but you're also not worthy of going to hell for all eternity. And so the teachings of the church is that there's some middle state that you go to, Hades, but but not what's what's what you experience in Hades could be like the the rich man uh, who is in flame and torment in Hades, or it could be like uh, Lazarus who was uh, with the uh, righteous Abraham and was feeling a foretaste of his judgment. Um, and and so there is some transitional period where people grow in grace and benefit from the prayers of the church, and then eventually, by the prayers of the church, they're able to then enter into the presence of God. Father Patrick, your comments here. 
Yeah, I probably, I'm probably slightly different on this point of view. Yeah, no, I, I don't think it's a purgation as such. Is it? I think it's, it's it's a testing of the soul's um, willingness to to allow God to be all in all. It's a it's a it's a check on the the motives, the desires, the the, the, the interior way of a soul. Um, and so, but it's not as as Father John says. It's not about any pain off of sins as such um it's it's orthodoxy sin is not so much about uh, a, a quantitative analysis we've got this or that sin it's it's about a state of the st soul and the, the question is is the state of a soul ready to well capable of union with god um rather than any particular sin or that or having to pay this off if a, if the state the soul was in the right state if it had some struggle or some issue but it was willing to repent it was willing to move from it but hadn't quite got there it's still in the right state so that's what's important um i do think there is an argument i i, I sort of take it a slightly different way to father john and i think I, I think that there are souls who, for state or a certain level of sin, sort of disqualifies them in a sense from union with God, although they are still in a state where they are able to be quite, um, united with God. In other words, they are baptized members of the church, um, and they are otherwise good standing of the church. Um, so haven't been actually formally excommunicated or anything like this. So, so but whose sins, I think, of the fruits of repentance, as Father John points out, haven't um, really got there. Now, I think in this case, um, I don't think there's any pain or for any growth of grace. I think once you're dead, you're dead, and there's no chance of repentance. Once you're separated from your body, you, you, that's it. You, you can't change it. However, the God, um, it, your sins, what sin? Well, sin is a, 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 a thing that divides you from other peoples or from God. It's, it's, it's an action, it's a way of thinking or a life which causes separation between you and other people. It causes tension, it causes division, it causes barriers, and, and it's, it's a blockage for perfect love, a perfect union of love. You either treat someone as an object, for example, you put them outside yourself, you, you're treating them something beyond, you're not treating them as a person, which is someone you can bond with in the fullness of love and, and, and in a sense, be with them, um, having them inside you as you, in a sense, be one body with them. Um, and so what God does is he loves the saints. And so if the saints, the righteous pray for someone, say, look, despite their sins, and despite the fact that their sins are not qualified for perfection of God, we want to live with this person. We want to accept this person. We want to stay in communion with this person. We want to have this person with us eternally. And God, for the love of the saints uh, who who are in themselves righteous, the prayers of an unrighteous person are not helpful in this, but the prayers of a righteous, this is why we pray to the saints, can bring through their desire, because God wants to please them, and if they're willing to put up with the person, <laughs> God will, uh, can overlook, in a sense, many things, as long as it's the basic framework of repentance is in place. Um, and so this is how I see it. In a sense, it's a bond of love overcomes the imperfections of the saints for the sake of the righteous. Um, so the person is, in a sense, in her. So I don't see any sort of purgatorial sense of any of this at all. It's all about state and then the bond of love, which, can be over um, minor sins, etc. Minor issues can be overcome by the love of the saints and their prayers and and desire to be with that person eternally, despite their problems. Father John, you alluded to a few uh, figures earlier. Could um, you maybe tell us a little bit in, in more detail? Who are some of the patristic witnesses that would testify to the concept of toll houses? Well, you. You find it in quotes from St. Cyril of Alexandria. You find it in the sayings of the Desert Fathers, the Philokalia. Um, like I said, St. Athanasius the Great wrote the life of St. Anthony the Great, and it's very clearly discussed, although the word toll houses is not used, but it's the exact same phenomenon uh, that, that he describes in there. St. Gregory the Great, in many of his lives, the saints, I think, also has stories that are in uh, that, that basically have the same concept. Uh, so it's in many of the lives of the Celtic saints, 
um, it, you'll, you'll find people having visions uh, of, of the fate of people who have departed that are the, express the same thing. And Father Patrick, do you have any comments on that as well? Um, I don't have any particular sources. Again, I, from what I read, I've seen the same thing um, through, not not directly toll houses per se so much, but certainly a trial with the angels and demons and stuff. And even more fascinating, there was this uh, story of this two secular men um, stuck on a mountain and um, the one of them passed, the other one was in sight, and, and he had a vision of a, sort of a demon coming out of the earth and dragging the soul of the other one who had died away. Um, these are just basic two atheists. They're just sort of, this is what I saw <laughs> when the, when the other one got, um, after he was rescued. So that that sort of idea fits exactly <laughs> what we're what we're talking about. And this is not someone who's religiously caught up. It's just someone he, he experienced a near near death himself um, of the, with the death of his friend. So so yes, I, I think from the the evidence out there. There's definitely a play of demons, and, and when people die, uh, yeah, it's, 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 there's so many stories of demons coming in and starting to choose. And certainly, I think the the wicked are dragged by the demons into hell. Um, we have got nothing with, with um, to hold them. There's no no support no, the, from the angels, um, so they just get sort of almost dragged straight away. Though it's interesting that there is this forty day um, tradition as well, well, liturgical tradition. We've got three days and uh, forty days. And, um, and we have a soul is said to visit this place and that place. Exactly how that works, I don't know. Um, and who, for whom that works, I'm not sure either. But um, certainly that's something about there. So, yeah, it's interesting. It seems to be some form of transition where humans don't just instantly jump from one place to another, but in a way that sort of like a human, <laughs> we sort of travel a little bit around time and space, even though we're not longer in, in a body. It's Exactly how this works, I I don't know until I find out for myself eventually. <laughs> but um, and then I'll probably be not in the state to come back and tell you. <laughs> mm -hmm. One more question, then and then we'll just open it up for you know free for all. Um, so, Father John, would you say that the concept of toll houses is related to the event that we see um, in the New Testament, where um, Saint Michael the Archangel? fights with Satan over the body of Moses. Is, is that kind of a, an allusion, an implicit allusion to um, toll houses? Is there something else going on there? I mean, it seems plausible. I would have to read what the fathers say about that uh, to confirm that that's what they would say. Now, one thing I should mention is there's a very hefty tome from St. Anthony, the great monastery that is the most exhaustive uh, catalog of all the patristic references to this and also scriptural references and service liturgical references and uh, so if someone wants to see it you'll you'll find it uh, exhaustively explored there mm. father patrick did you have any follow-up comments there before we move on um though it could be related and like father john I, i'd have to defer to the fathers exactly i think there is a slight distinction though it is specifically of the body of um Moses, and there is a special sort of sense of it's been guarded in, in, in a way beyond sort of normal bodies. Um, so um, I think it, it highlights there is a the angels are involved in our lives and stuff as defenders and accusers, as certain tempters. Um, there's a real we have a real guardian angel, <laughs> the demons are really out there <laughs> throwing thoughts at us, and so they scrubble over the body. Um, as, as part of that. So that's all part of the general theme of the angelic involvement in our lives um, as, in a sense, our servants in some strange strange way. Which I think like Satan fell. <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> You're really a servant of that? <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's the actual mystery of what humanity is, actually, and especially the Mother God <laughs> who transcends the, the seraphim. Um, uh, yeah, but so, yeah, there's definitely that, and that's all part of the Toll Houses thing, and the Mark and Kul Major thing is all part of that general theme. Yeah, Father, you mentioned there that um, 
they they would be involved in accusations post mortem, and it, it reminds me of in the book of Zechariah. You have uh, Joshua, the high priest, who's being accused by Satan. Um, so I, I kind of wonder if that's also maybe an indirect allusion to it. I, I don't know. We like like y'all said, we'd have to look into the patristic witnesses there. But well, well, yeah, charge as well with, with the story of Satan coming up the garden. <laughs> <laughs> right. Let me get him. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll open it up for y'all to just have a free flowing dialogue if y'all would like to now, uh, whichever of y'all can start it. Well, I think we're, we're pretty much in agreement with most, <laughs> most things. Um, let's. So, I haven't seen a lot directly saying, talking about toll houses per se, using that word in the services. Uh, Father John, have you seen that mentioned as specifically as such in many services? And if so, can you remember which? I know it's mentioned in the, um, in the canon uh, for the departure of the soul by St. Andrew of Crete that's in the um, Book of Needs. And it's in both the Greek and the Slavonic text, and so it, and there it uses the uh, the actual word in Greek or in Slavonic as well. And um, so, in, in any edition of the Book of Needs that said it all complete, you're you're going to find it. So this is not just a Russian thing or a Greek thing; it's a universal thing. All right. Thank you. Yep. And Metropolitan Hilrothios Vlakos also in his book. Uh, Life After Death, I think it is. He has a chapter on this subject, and it's kind of interesting because he he mentions the controversy in America. So basically, for those who maybe don't know the background of the where this controversy began, you had a back and forth between Father Sarah from Rose and uh, Lev Puhalo, who's now the very most retired Archbishop Lazar Puhalo, of the OCA, who is a retired OCA bishop who was never a non-retired OCA bishop. That's a long story, but uh, but they had a lot of back and forth. And um, Metropolitan Herothios Vlako sorts of he puts Archbishop in quotes when he ref references uh, his very most retiredness, and uh, uh, he basically comes out on Father Seraphim Rose's side, although he 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 kind of qualifies his his position on the controversy a little bit, but everything he says after the mentioning this controversy backs up what Father Sarah from Rose said. And like Father Thomas Hopko, he says that you find it throughout the fathers and the services. So he doesn't say that it's just here and there. But but now if you were to just say, where do you find the word toll houses, then you'd be talking about a more narrow slice of the pie. Uh, but, but you have fathers that, that talk about tax collector, you know, demons coming on like tax collectors. So that the, there, the, the, the word toll house itself is not used, but the idea is very clearly the same image. And if you, if you had a concept of how tax collectors were in the ancient world, you would see why this would be a fearsome image because a tax collector had the power to destroy people. He could put them in prison if he said that they didn't pay their taxes. And he, tax collectors often took a lot more than was really due them. They were unjust and cruel. That's the reason why tax collectors were thought of so poorly in the Gospels. And so that's why the image is used. It's not because it's a financial transaction or anything like that, but it's just, it was an image that resonated with people in the ancient world. Yeah, but it's, it's interesting that it fits in with the, 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 the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And it is a real sense um, that we are debtors. And um, but but again, this points to what I was saying about the way of salvation is the standard is perfection, and we fall continually short of the perfection of God. We can't do the good of God, so we can't love as God loves. We can't be kind as God's kind, patient as God is patient. This is the standard to which we we go, and so we're always falling in debt to the to the levels of. Of our being, that's what the demons are coming to do <laughs> to, to uh, pay the debt. Well, you, you, how can you be united to God? You, you, you've fallen short. You, you're indebted to the love of this person and that person, and and this and and this work and that work. You, 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 um, and so, uh, I can see that tax collector imagery fitting really in quite well with that. Um, well, I suppose my question is: is given that sort of, I think 
not extremely literal sense of toll houses, a little bar and gates, and you go from one to the, t the other, but the, the trial of angels and, and even allowing for angels to have different things. I mean, I think the angelic orders are on orders, and so some might accuse of one type of thing, and there'll be an angel of this type of sin, and I, I have no problem with with that. And, and in some form of sequential process, I, uh, we can't take everything all at once instantaneously being in limited creatures. What is the problem that some people have with it. I've got a good friend of mine who seems to be quite against it. I'm not sure if he just gets it because he just sees it as a literalistic thing and he's opposed to that. Or do you have any idea apart from just claiming heresy, which you said before, why they might have an issue? I think the issue that a lot of modern people that they have with it is because they're basically, they have an empiricist worldview with God slapped on top. And uh, so the idea that demons and angels actually are a thing that do that have a real impact on our world is something that they don't allow for. And so, so when they're presented with the views of the of the fathers that this really is a thing, they want to say, oh, no, no, it's just me and God and maybe the devil in some theoretical sense. Uh, but but mainly it's just me and God. Uh, this is just not the way people in the ancient world thought. And when you read the, the uh, epistles of St. Paul, for example, he says, we wrestle not with, with flesh and blood, but with principalities, powers. And he goes down this list of various ranks of, of demons. And he talks about, uh, you know, there being ranks of angels as well. I mean, obviously this was a real important thing for St. Paul because he mentions it pretty frequently, but these kinds of people don't have any room for that. And so they just want to, they see it as primitive and uh, anybody who gives it any credence as being, you know, just slightly maybe better off than an animus that worships trees or something. But 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 they're not allowing themselves to open up their minds and have a, a biblical orthodox uh, worldview. Right. Yeah, that would make sense. <laughs> Father, you, you mentioned their <clears throat> principalities and powers and demons, and, and Paul talks about uh, the ruler of the kingdom of the air. Very odd phrase. Right. Uh, is that maybe an allusion to Toll Houses? It, it definitely, the way the fathers interpret it, that's what that that's what they see happening. You know, they're, they're the prince and power, the, the devil is the prince and power of the air. With And that's why we talk about aerial Toll Houses. Uh, and uh, so when your soul is in transit, this is the area that you're passing through. This is the area where the demons, you know, have some uh, some ability to say something if you give them the ability to say something. If you give them some place by by your lack of repentance. Now, you know, this subject I, I get asked about this by my parishioners from time to time, and what I've always tried to impress upon them is the fact that yes, it is a tradition. I'll explain it to them, but some people are terrified by the idea, and what I try to impress upon them is, is that the, the point of the teaching is not because we have to learn a set of secret handshakes or passwords to get through the toll houses. We just have to repent and we have to have the right relationship with Christ. And if we do that, then we don't have anything to worry about. So if you just keep a clean slate and trust in God for, for, for his mercy and cooperate with his grace, then you're not going to have any problems. You know, the, your, your guardian angel will, will help you navigate it. You won't have to, it, you don't have to have read every book on the toll houses to be able to experience salvation. There's lots of people who are in, in heaven today that uh, probably never heard of the concept, uh, and that's okay. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that. But I think also I was going to say that there's um, quite clear. Of the world and and those who are not in the church and not of Christ are in, are in a sense under the authority of the demons under the authority of Satan. Um, in, in other words, Adam in a sense um, turning his back on God, joined in with this, with Satan and and Satan is much more powerful. So you you come under his authorities and um, as as a sort of thing and so. The demons, uh, we are set free from this authority through Christ, through baptism, through through that. And once we are set free, um, we are free indeed. However, if we want to surrender ourselves back into the authority of Satan by re 
sinning again and turning our backs on God, we can we can end up back in a situation. And and so yes, the, the, the Satan and the and the, the demons will be trying to claim their authority over us. Say no, no, we is endowed them, and you're not not yours because of X, Y, and Z. And look, he's a sinner. <laughs> he's he's doing that. He's nothing to do with you. Um, and so yeah, I think. Yeah, it just makes so much sense in reality that these angels and stuff. Yeah, God has not just created humans; He's created <laughs> a whole range of different creatures, <laughs> spiritual and physical. Um, so yeah, I can't see why you wouldn't deny it. But it's certainly I think, it's totally full of scriptures and all this sort of stuff. It's, it's, um, if somebody does deny this, who's Eastern Orthodox, would you say that they're in sin, uh, Father John? What's your impression here? Well, I mean, God knows someone's heart. And I suppose that if someone, you know, was in a parish and they had a priest that said, oh, this is nonsense. And they just accepted the what their priest told them because they assumed that he knew what he was talking about. I don't think that it would be a sin for them to be misinformed. I, I do think that when people are presented with the mounds of evidence that this is found throughout the tradition of the church and they still reject it, that that's a sign of someone who's not thinking in an orthodox way. And, and they, you know, to, to have an orthodox mind, one of the key things is you have to have a sense of humility that you don't know everything. And uh, there's a lot of things that I can't explain uh, in, in terms of the church's teachings or the scriptures. I know that they're true when the church teaches it. I don't have to understand every aspect of it or to be able to explain it. I certainly have never experienced the toll houses. And when I, I pass, I'll have a much better idea of what we're talking about than I do right now. But I accept the authority of the church. And uh, and I, I think we just have to have a humility that if the church teaches it, it's true. Uh, you know, th it's it's really that simple. I, if, if I could choose what the church, what the truth was, I'd be a universalist. You know, I'd say everybody gets goes to heaven and it's all good. You know, that would be my choice. But that's not what the church teaches, and, and I don't get to make things up. I have to I have to be humble and assume that God knows what he's doing, and the church understands a lot better than I do. Mm. Father Patrick, uh, same question. Yeah, pretty much um, I agree on, with Father John on that. Um, yeah, I think if you get to a stage where, as Father John suggests, it could be almost a denial of angels and demons, I think there's some – it's starting to get troubling if you're actually denying that there are angels and demons. Uh, either you're deluded, or um, you're, you're, there is a question of your faith about what reality is. And so, Phobos is not up there necessarily in something which is absolute in the sense of the creedal statements of a, of a church. Um, it's pretty much if you're starting to know uh, that Satan exists. Um, well, then you're starting to have massive problems with the whole way of salvation. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I think, uh, though I would hope for the best and this sort of ignorance or something like that, I think that any statement which is starting to get really, someone starting to get really dogmatic, I think is a, is a serious risk. And I think someone who's actually thinking to enter into an argument on this on the internet puts a solid serious risk if they're starting to deny in public um things like angels and demons and things like that or the testimony of the fathers that's really dangerous if it's some minor mild opinion as his as father says it's if your priest says it and you then even uh, even i'll look back that there a second then there's a sort of sense of okay it's not that serious it is an absolute sense however um, part of what I was going to say is that part of our Christian life is the, our, not only uh, receiving grace, but we have to grow. We have to accept that we've got to move toward infinitely. We've got to grow in the virtues. We've got to learn. We, we can't sit in the <laughs> willful ignorance. We, we must learn and grow and um and in all humility and so anybody just says oh well, that's what professor is and, 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 but then gets engaged with a question and doesn't sort of try to seek more try to understand you know grow not to say we can ever understand anything perfectly but to at least try to develop it and just sort of says there's another question <laughs> of, a, of a matter so yeah I, I, it's it's but it's if it's rejected because i just reject the idea of a literal 
little gates and stuff and somehow a little stairway path going up to heaven and little gates and little angels sitting there going hello <laughs> little demon in the box then okay I, I haven't got a problem with that um but yeah but once you start ex expressing your thoughts publicly and money then there's a much stricter judgment on anyone on any issue that does that if if it, it breaks the unity of mind on any point with the, with the church with the fathers um of christ and, and what reality is so um yes and actually this does touch on part of the creed because we say i believe in one god the father almighty maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible so when we talk about the invisible creation we're talking about angels and demons so you know, if you're dismissing that aspect of the tradition of the church you're denying the creed there there are some really good questions that I'm seeing here in the chat. Let's take a few, if, unless y'all had a, another direction y'all wanted to uh, continue to go. Um, this one is from Weinschel. Are there any scriptures referencing toll houses by the Eastern Orthodox, uh, which, if any, uh, either one of y'all? There's a, There are a number of passages that are interpreted by the fathers as talking about it. But one of them I've already mentioned, and that's the parable of the rich fool, where God says to him, tonight they shall require thy soul of thee. It's, it's translated usually as tonight your soul will be required, as if it's passive. But it actually says, tonight they will require your soul of thee. And Blessed Theophilac says, who's the they here? And then he goes on to describe it. These are the fearsome angels that come on like tax collectors. So I, I think that's probably the clearest passage of Scripture, but there are a number of other passages of Scripture that talk about uh, this issue in a, in a in less direct way, and the fathers interpret it in that way. Uh, Father Patrick, did you have a follow I haven't got any specific Scriptures on that, but I think we've, we've touched on a few various points of Scripture, like even the, the Moses, the fighting over the, the body, which are sort of in this sort of indicative of this type of thing happening. Um, so, yes, I, I, any specific, I, 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 sorry, I don't have that on, on hand at the moment. The book, um, the book by St. Anthony, the Great Monastery, it, it goes into great detail on this issue. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I've, I've heard about it before, too. I, I've been meaning to check it out. Uh, did, go ahead, Father. I was going to say, it's, it's a wonderful text. And what's interesting to me is that I've seen people dismiss the text and basically say it's it comes from a fundamentalistic perspective, although you see it endorsed by a number of pretty hefty uh, Orthodox scholars. and uh, But I've never seen any of them actually take it apart on the merits. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's simply because they can't. They, they, mm -hmm. they, they, they cannot make an argument with the evidence is actually presented. Uh, this is similar to what I asked, but uh, it's slightly different. How similar is the concept of purgation in toll houses to your, under, um, to your understanding of Catholic purgatory, similarities and differences, uh, starting with you, Father John? Well, I can tell you that when I was a Protestant and I read about purgatory, I thought, well, these Catholics are just a bunch of pagans. I don't know where they get this stuff. And then when I became Orthodox and I became aware of the Orthodox Church's teaching, I'd say, oh, well, I guess that's where they got it from. But the difference would be the whole idea of whether you've got a meter, like a taxi meter, that you're paying off in, in purgatory by suffering so much uh, to, to before you're allowed to enter in the kingdom of heaven versus the Orthodox view is, is that Either you're in a state with at least the beginnings of repentance, in which case you ultimately will be saved. And it's just a question of how much time it's going to take for you to, to grow in grace. And it's not that you're doing anything yourself that is advancing you along this growth, but it is through the prayers of the saints and the church that you grow in grace and you're eventually able to enter in the presence of God. Because if you're not ready to enter the presence of God, it obviously wouldn't be a good thing for you to do so. It wouldn't be beneficial for you. So there's some period of time where you have to be prepared, so to speak, uh, for that to happen. And so and there are definitely the, the, the two teachings come from the same sort of uh, basic concepts, but I, th those are the differences. 
Father Patrick, did you have any comments? Yeah, well, I, I also see that the, the, the toll houses of the, of the trial of angels is, is a sense of a particular judgment when you're solved. And then that's prior to any concept of a purgatory or, or, or place of waiting or a semi haiti or whichever what you ever want to describe it as. So, so the, the actual toll are about the judgment process before getting to the next stage, which yeah. would, would be a purgatory or whatever. So it, it, it's not the purgatory itself. It, it is a judgment process if there was a bit towards where you should go to purgatory if, if such a thing existed. Right. Yeah. Um, are toll houses mentioned by pre-schism uh, Western fathers and writers, uh, starting with you, Father, uh, Father John, and then Father Patrick? I'm not sure if they actually use the word toll house, but they certainly talk about it. As I mentioned, St. Gregory the Dialogist has a number of the lives of, of Western saints. And also, I have an article. If you go to Orthodox Wiki and you look up uh, toll houses, there's an article that's linked there that I put on the web of patristic evidence and, uh, and from the lives of the saints. And there's a number of Western fathers' lives that, uh, like St. Uh, Columba, for example, is one that I remember. I think St. Dunstan. Uh, and so it's there. Father Patrick? Again, I haven't looked at them on the specific question of toll houses, um, but certainly my experiences were the same um, experiences you get in the Eastern Fathers, you know, so the, the life of St. Columba, et cetera. They're just expressing the same sort of um, things. I mean, just as a little side note, um, I find the life of St. Columba so fascinating because he, he sneaks off to a chapel to pray and his disciple comes up and watches him. And there's a glowing of divine light. And I think, whoa, that's just a completely Mount Athos experience <laughs> that's going on. And there's so the, the Celtic spirituality then was um, just the same. And when one of the saints dies, there's a beam of light. Now, this is exactly repeated to all the saints in the East. So from what I'm getting from the saints' stories, is they're they looking at they definitely have got all the demons, they've got all the angels. This is all part of a living fiber of Western Christianity, and I can't see any difference between that and and the, and the East on any of these points. And, and fathers, I appreciate y'all coming on and talking about this. This has been extremely clarifying for myself, and I'm sure for plenty of others who are watching as well. I want to invite y'all to give us uh, some closing uh, or concluding thoughts, Father John, beginning with you, and then uh, Father Patrick. Well, the main thing I would want to impress upon people is have humility of mind and accept the teachings of the church, even if you don't fully understand how they work. Uh, just accept that they are true and ask God to help you to understand it. But also know that the main thing is, is to focus on repenting and trusting in God's mercy and working out your repentance and allowing God's grace to change you. And if you're if you're striving to live a Christian life and you love God and you love your neighbor, the toll houses are not going to be a problem for you. And, and so just you, you don't need to 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 read all the books. You don't have to uh, do an acathos to Father Sarah from Rose every day or anything like that. But you but you do need to uh, uh, work on your relationship with Christ and, and trust him and he'll get you through it. Yeah. And I'm pretty much <laughs> back the same thing up. Um, yeah, I, I think one well, of some of these issues is best to try to take a um, not get it too polarized on one side <laughs> or the of the other. I, I think there's it's sort of a bit of a storm in the teacup in some ways. I think what is important is that we do have suffer a judgment afterwards. The angels and the demons are involved. They do exist. They are involved. There's good reasons why that is the case. But as Father John says, Christ has set us free from the demons, etc. Um, we can't be saved by our own power. Um, it's all by the grace of God. As long as we're willing for it to, um, for Him to, <laughs> He can't force us because otherwise He destroys our freedom. Um, so we have to be willing for it. Now it actually ends up being quite hard because <laughs> you feel like, oh, I don't want to do that. But 
we have, the, if you are, as Father John says, if you're living the life of the church, you're, you're, you're going to church regularly, you're taking communion, you're living a life of repentance, you're, you're confessing regularly, um, all the normal things of a Christian Christian life, Satan doesn't have anything on you. He can't grab you out of, snatch you out of Christ's hand. Um, if Once you're in the church, you, you, you're, you're secure by Christ. Unless you really sort of start to deviate yourself off and throw yourself into Satan's hand, Christ is not going to stop you leaping out of his hand. If, so, so in other words, basically, if you're following the life of the church, you're trying as your best you can to, to come to, to Christ, you have nothing to fear. Um, but if you're going to start getting slack, failing to turn up to church, refusing to repent of any sins, that's the biggest thing, refusing to confess, denying, oh, I'm a good person, or just start to get deluded by this way, oh, I'm a good person, <laughs> that's the worst disaster, <laughs> um, then, um, yeah, you can get you can get in trouble. But otherwise, if, you, if you're humble and all the rest of these things, that's not a problem. Um, Christ is protecting you and guiding you, so it's not a, it's not like a horror story. You've got to... You've got to worry about it. And as I say, it's not about every single detail of what you've done or haven't done and things like that. It's the state of your soul. Are you really willing to be let God be all in all in you? Um, are you wanting to be like God? Now, a matter of fact, very few people are, actually. But, it's not again, it's not about you missing some little point here or failing to do something, not lighting the right enough candles or something like that. It's a general state of soul. And um, basically following a normal practice of the church, you're fine. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you all, uh, fathers, for coming on and doing this. Very enlightening. And y'all are welcome on any time to discuss any other issue that y'all would like to do. Thank you. Thanks for having us on. Thank you, fathers. And everybody, thank y'all for watching. And I appreciate y'all's participation there in the chat. Great questions and great comments as well. And of course, don't forget to like and subscribe and share this on your social media. And also check us out, patreon.com forward slash reason and theology if you want to support us. Until next time, God bless.